Connor gets it. He got him. He goes down swinging. And a swing and a miss. Strike three. And that's a nice pitch by Ennis. A beautiful pitch by Ennis. Strike three call. Welcome to this edition of One on One. I'm Howie Rose. Some years ago, if you would have told me, I'd be sitting down with former Mets pitcher Jeff Innes. My first reaction would be, uh-oh, I'm in <laughs> trouble. Because most of the time that Jeff was pitching for the Mets, he talked about wanting to work for the FBI someday. Come clean, Mr. Innes. First of all, it's great to see you. Second, most importantly, did you ever hook up with the FBI? <laughs> great to see you, first of all. Uh, <laughs> No, I didn't. I, you know, at the time, I didn't know that they had to actually do an extensive background check on you. And so you thought you'd just join up. Like, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. That's what stretch. I thought. But <laughs> obviously that, no, I, I kind of lost interest. I wanted to make headlines in some way. So I think I said that at some point, but, uh, I still watch like the forensic files and Dateline on own. I watch all those shows. So, so, but you ended up getting a psychology degree in college, right? Yeah. So how would you then analyze wanting to work in the FBI and then just saying, ah, who needs that? Huh. I don't know. How do you come to grips with that one? You know, I think I was so, I was, my, my career was always so tenuous uh, as a middle relief pitcher in New York that I was always looking at what I was going to do post-baseball. And I think I spent a decent amount of time. Uh, I think they also uh, put me up in a box once to like make one of the appearances the players make with uh, an FBI group. And so that kind of... Uh, re that kind of drove the point home that maybe I want to do that because those guys are really cool. And Who's they, by the way, who set this the up? The mess, Jay, Jay Horowitz. Oh, I, yeah. I was going to say, this has yeah. either Jay or Franco written all over it. Yeah, yeah. Their fingerprints are all over that idea. <laughs> but, you know, you talk about middle relief and back way, way, way back in the day when you pitched for the Mets, middle relief meant you had to throw sometimes three, four innings in a game. Right. Imagine doing that now. I mean, the, the guy would not be allowed to pitch for a month after three or four innings in one game. That's so true. Do you, do you watch the game now, and do you, do you yeah. think, boy, I, could, I can prosper in this all over again? Yes and no. I mean, I'm at a, the game has evolved in such a way now where uh, an 85-mile-an-hour fastball throw would never even get an opportunity, I don't think. So I don't think I'd ever pitch in the big leagues now. Then again, if I were to get an opportunity, you know, I always felt like my strength here was having the ability to go out every single day and pitch. I mean, I knew that was my value to the team. And I would pitch two or three innings and be ready to go the next day and the next day after that. And, and I prided myself on never saying no. I'm, I'm ready. I can pitch. And how'd you hold up physically doing that? If you pitch two or three innings today, and whomever was managing needed you that next day for an inning or even a batter or two, would that have been out of the question? Never, never, never. My role was just such that that was my value to the team, was always having a guy down there that could pitch and pitch every day. So I always said yes. Well, you said yes when Davey Johnson said, help, I need a starter. In 1987, remember now, in 1987, the Mets are coming off a world championship and one by one, it seemed that everybody on the pitching staff, at least among the starters, got hurt first half of that season. They were going down like dominoes. So what were the circumstances around which Davey said, I need you to start a game for me? Well, we were in San Francisco, and I, I don't remember every detail, but we had a couple guys hurt, um, and I think Rick Aguilera was supposed to pitch that night, and, uh, and he was actually warming up and couldn't, couldn't continue. So it was like literally 20 minutes before the game. And they just called me out of the bullpen. I, I um, took warm-ups and I was in there. I mean, it was pretty quick. San Francisco in those days, Candlestick Park, is that where you made yeah. your debut? That, yeah. That's not the easiest place to, to play, let alone pitch and sort of be the center of attention on the mound. Did you feel any of the wind or the cold or whatever the conditions were? Or were you so locked in to this first big league start that you're totally oblivious to it. Well, the conditions I, were, I was used to at that point, I was just trying to get through a few innings, basically, you know. I won't lie to you. When I was warming up, I was thinking, God, what if I go like eight innings? Remember when Terry Leach made that start in Montreal yes. and he went like eight innings? Yep. That was my dream, but it never happened. But um, anyway, uh, you know, I, I think I went four innings and we were in the game, so I did my job. But um, it was just, it was very quick, so I didn't have a chance to get nervous or really contemplate much. When did you join the team in 87 prior to that first start? My first call up was May 16th and uh, of, of that year. That was my first time ever in the big leagues. And 
I can't remember actually if this was on, on my first call up or my second that I, I made that start. But, um, you know, I was still new, but I'd pitched enough in enough games to feel comfortable and not get really that nervous, you know. So I was excited actually, you know. So it was kind of cool. And yet, you know, I think back to those days and that team, and you come along, an even tempered, nice, mild mannered kid, and you're cohabitating in that clubhouse with some certifiable lunatics. Yeah. And they could be pretty tough right. on the newbies. How were you accepted? I mean, I got along with everybody really well. And, um, you know, I just kind of did my own thing. And you got to remember, too, I was up and down a lot. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't really part of the fabric of the clubhouse. So I think that helped stave off a lot of the, you know, uh, not bullying, so to speak, but, you know, the, you know, picking on the rookie. Well, it, you know, it, it's still hard to accept because it's, I mean, it's not quite a year that we're taping this since we lost Mel Stottlemyre, yeah. who had been sick for a long time and was just such a, a, a wonderful man. And everything you've heard people say about Mel Stottlemyre is true. He was just a special human being. It's as simple as that. And I would imagine that in what could be a maelstrom in that crazy clubhouse, if ever there was a calming influence, particularly one that you had to deal with as a pitching coach, it would be Mel. So what was his impact and influence on you? As you're coming up, you get all uh, in the minor leagues, you get, you have a million pitching coaches that have a million things to say, and you kind of get through your own head whether you're going to listen to that or not. You, you listen with an open mind and you make a decision if you're going to listen to this pitching tip or this one. But when Mel said something, you did it, you know, and it's just a respect. It wasn't that he was invoked fear in anyone he just commanded a respect and he was like a like a strong father type figure and and then you knew about his success and history and uh, so I mean it, he just had that presence I don't know it was just a, a a very strong presence and you talk about his success as a pitcher Mel was a great sinker ball pitcher during his days with the Yankees. And although stylistically you were different because you're kind of a side armor. Right. But at the same time, you learned to throw the sinker, which was right. Mel's bread and butter. So how much did Mel influence that pitch for you? You know, he didn't influence it like as far as the uh, beginning or me discovering the pitch, but he influenced it greatly in me not letting it get away from me. So he reinforced the importance of the pitch and the important elements of that pitch like keeping your shoulder in, finger pressure, finishing, things like that. He was, it was, it was great, the, his advice. And you mentioned a guy just a short while ago, Terry Leach, who was almost a doppelganger stylistically, although right. I think he came from a little further down than you did. But, you know, still, Terry was a, a right-handed side armor. You were a right-handed side armor. Uh, did the two of you work in cahoots, or was there a rivalry there, or how did that relationship work? We were really close, um, and we didn't really talk pitching all the time, oddly enough, but he was, like, he was a few years older than me, and I looked at him as kind of a mentor, and um, on, on and off the field, he was a really good guy, too. Terry and I tended to both do well at the same time, which was kind of contradictory to the school of thought, having two sidearm pitchers on the same team. We always did well when we were on the same team. We coexisted really well, both on and off the field. And as that team started to change, as all teams do, but you know, gradually some of the key players from 86 were moving on, and eventually so did Davey Johnson as well, and Buddy Harrelson is one of the great people of all time who you know, I like to think could have been the third base coach here forever. Right. Um, I don't think he ever really wanted to manage, but Frank Cashin wanted him to, and, and he did. When you think of Buddy as a manager as opposed to Davey, who was a rebel, and Buddy anything but, what was the difference in the clubhouse in those first few weeks or months after the change? Being new and not really part of the, the, the deep fabric of the team, I may not be the best one to ask that question, but... Buddy, you know, with his history with the Mets and just being a lifelong Met, had that strong uh, kind of continuous uh, strength that the, that the Mets, I think, wanted and needed then. But, you know, it's funny because when I think of Buddy and when I think of a lot of people, I, I think about the type more of person they are rather than the, the baseball person they were. And so uh, when... Uh, there was a time when they were retiring Nolan Ryan's number. You remember that? And Buddy had to take, uh, he took the day off and went down to Texas 
to, to be with Nolan Ryan that day. And I said, and here's me, you know, Buddy, like, Buddy, and I, I was just a middle relief pitcher, up and down quite a bit. And I said, hey, Buddy, can you get me Nolan Ryan's autograph? <laughs> and, like, I didn't expect So the next day, he comes back, and he's got a program with Nolan Ryan's autograph for me. You know, that's what I remember about but Buddy Harrison. That's nutshell, Buddy. One of the most caring yeah. people. And then you look back at, at what he did as a player, and he's just, yeah, I mean, he's just an amazing man, amazing Met. Were you able to stay in touch with him after your playing days ended? A little bit in the beginning, but you know, it, it's like baseball's kind of weird. At least it was for me, in, in that I lost touch with a lot of uh, a lot of former uh, teammates. Um, I'm connected with a couple, but you'd be surprised how I'm not. Who know? are the ones you're closest with now that you played with here? Some of the guys in fantasy camp now, you know, like Barry Lyons. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember John Mitchell used sure. to pitch. Yeah. He was really funny. And, um, He's really funny? Cause John, it, John. Yeah, oh, because yeah. there was one incident. I don't think you were here yet. You might have been. I say it was an incident, but I mean, Keith Hernandez still, still talk about this every now and then. They needed to um, put the appeal play on, and Keith goes out to the mound and says to John Mitchell, okay, we got to appeal this. And Mitch says, okay, what do I do? <laughs> he, had, <laughs> he had no idea yeah. how to initiate it. So I don't know if that's just part of his personality being funny or if it was just part of the raw, you know, wet behind the ears kid that he was at that time. But, you know, when you consider everything that went on in those, in those days, it was, they were somewhat turbulent times for the Mets yeah. too, because they were going through a transition. So when, when did you, if you ever did, and I don't know other than, you know, a handful of players who come along would tell you candidly that, you know, they ever really feel secure as a major leaguer. But there must have been a point along those five or six years you were here when you said, okay, I, I got this. I'm a major leaguer now to yeah. stay. When did you start to get that feeling? I think it was in 1990 90 or 91. Um, the first three years I was up and down all the time. And then Jerry Hunsicker, who was the, I think the assistant general manager at the time, came up to me toward the end of spring training and said, you're on this team. Don't worry about getting sent down. I just want you to breathe you know, for the first time in a long time. And then I was up for the next three years. So I think that's when I felt like I was part of the team for good. My first three years were very humbling and I just r retained or remained in that mode of being very happy to be there, very uh, uh, fortunate, having that, um, that just fortunate feeling and, and, and never really letting it get to my head because I just had been up and down so many times. I just truly did appreciate being there. And you got to pitch one year in about 70-odd games, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So when you come to the park every day and you know there's a pretty good chance you're going to get into the game, Yeah. how did that change the dynamics of you sitting in the bullpen in the third or fourth inning as opposed to when you didn't have that feeling that the phone would ring? Yeah, that was always who I was. Even when I was up and down, it was like I was just a guy that would pitch all the time. So that's just something that I carried with me every day during the year. Like even during the daytime, before we even came to the park, no one I might pitch that day. Like I didn't go out and golf and stuff like that. I just got ready for the game. And that was just a daily kind of um, maintenance thing, if you will. Uh, so you pitched here through, I believe, part of 93. Were you here when Dallas Green took over as manager? Yeah, I finished the year here. What was it like pitching for Dallas, who was very set in his ways about how he yeah. wanted a game to run, let's say, yeah. players to behave? So Dallas, being a former pitcher, I thought he would be more of a, of a pitcher's manager, but he, he really wasn't. And although I had great respect for him, and he was a strong presence um, anywhere he went, I remember um, at one point during that season I was struggling a little bit, and uh, he, he came up to me and I said, you know, I think I've been flying open a little bit, and you know, I worked with Mel today, and uh, down at Mel Stottlemyre down before the game, and, uh, I think I got it figured out, and I really did feel like that. And he said, um, he goes, well, I don't know about any of that. All I know is you got to pitch with head and heart. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, really? That's all you know? <laughs> you know? I mean, come on. Yeah, you mean more than that. But, you know, that's really the way he was. I mean, he, was very, he looked at the game in a very simple, strong way. Uh, so. so once you left the Mets, I think you pitched briefly for the Twins after that, very briefly, but um, yeah. what's post-baseball been like? Any pangs of wanting to get back in at any point along the way? No. 
No, I mean, I loved playing. I loved doing this stuff, uh, coming back every once in a while. Um, I'm a fan of baseball. I think it's important in life when you've done something that you've really enjoyed to treat it in such a way that you don't have regrets and you don't look back on it with that longing. It was really important to me to be successful doing something else. You know, I look back on my days as a Met and playing baseball with just joy and, and, and gratitude, and, and now I've, I'm living the rest of my life. You're still up at fantasy camp every spring, right? Yeah, I am. I love it. And I'll tell you, a lot of those guys that in fantasy camp, they, you see how they love the game. I mean, they love the game. They're crazy for the Mets and baseball. And that's helped me, actually, uh, you know, uh, kind of find a little more passion for the game myself. So, Jeff, yeah. it's great to see you again. You too, Howie. Thank Welcome you so much. Welcome back to New York. Thank you. Jeff Innes, our guest on One on One. I'm Howie Rose. We'll see you next time.